cars and computers. And it was very hard to use those. They were inefficient. In a lot of ways, it was hard to use them in meaningful ways. And coming back now, in 2010, I see um, how much it has made a difference for our students and our teachers in the effectiveness and um, the use of technology in meaningful ways. So we're very excited, and I'm very proud of this team for the work that they've done in this area. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Jamie Trudell. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is, um, I just to introduce us. Jamie Trudell <laughs> and Britt. Santa Maria. <laughs> and over here we have Britt Santa Maria. <laughs> Visa Albright and Maria Cannon. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jamie Trudell. Great. Thank you. Oops, of course this is turned off All right. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about um, technology at LHS and kind of about how we got here. I was fortunate enough to speak to the school board about almost two years ago now after we first had our Promethean boards installed and to talk about what technology was like then. And so to start off with, uh, technology is huge. It has been funded in several different ways in our building. The first was second grade was through a lot of grants back in, back then when we started bringing our, our um, Promethean boards and our active votes into the classroom. Since then, both Robin and Charlie, um, Mr. Grossman and Mrs. Burdick, you know, allocated as much as they could in terms of school funds, I think, really supporting the teacher's drive of technology in this building. And the other thing is professional development money. Um, teachers have really took it am amongst themselves to go to conferences and workshops that encourage professional development in the area of technology in the classroom that sometimes involved bringing technology back into the classroom from those workshops. So tonight I'm, we're going to talk to you about some different types of technologies. Um, the first one right here is um, a netbook, um, the active board, which is what you're looking at right now. Some people call them a smart board. Um, it's kind of like a name brand. It is an interactive whiteboard. Ours are Promethean board here in this building. Um, we're going to talk about document cameras, active votes, iPads, iPods, uh, flip cams are used, LCD projectors, and the active slate, which is what I'm working on right now. So the benefits of an interactive whiteboard. Why do we want these in the classrooms? Oops, we jumped, pardon me. Student engagement. It's unbelievable how this board can change the engagement in the classroom in terms of the amount of time you can sustain lessons. Efficient lessons. It's all here, it's ready to go. You can move through a lesson in a really great pace because there's no wait time for students. Multimedia. We're able to provide media to these generation of learners that is really, truly engaging to them. Teacher investment. It takes some time to make this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're really invested in our curriculum and our content due to the time that we do spend on it. Uh, sustains attention. Part of a 21st century classroom. We're preparing these learners to go into the 21st century of jobs, which is going to involve technology. Having all this technology at their fingertips and watching the teachers interact it is really going to encourage this. It meets different types of learning styles. An instant assessment tool. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we talk about the active votes. And less paper used. Who can beat that? Um, so let me show you some pictures of this happening. Um, at a walk through the, the downstairs, K-1-2, I took a picture in each grade level in terms of what was going on in technology in a moment at Little Harbor School. The first one is a picture of Mrs. Santa Maria in her classroom um, with her students. You can see her students on the rug, all of them, eyes on that board right there. Um, they're learning how to play a math game, which um, Lisa will later show you the slide of. And there's a student up front with Mrs. Santa Maria going over the game. Students aren't gathered in a circle, huddling over, trying to see that game being taught. Every single student can see that game, and that student is helping model the game with Mrs. Santa Maria. Here's a kindergartner up at the board, um, do, brand new board that they just got installed a couple weeks ago, and it, working on her morning letter. Um, they're putting letters into words. And you can see all the hands up in the crowd as every single one of those kindergartners is waiting their turn to hopefully be the next person to go up to their, the interactive whiteboard. And this is a first grade classroom during word work. And this child was blending um, word, letters together to make words um, up on their interactive whiteboard in their classroom. Um, what I'm using right here, this is called an active slate. This is a new piece of technology that's come into a couple classrooms. Um, it goes along with our Promethean board. You can see it's wireless. 
I'll stay put because I'm supposed to be up here so you can at home see <laughs> me. Um, but the idea of this is it allows the teacher to be mobile in the classroom. So if you need to go and redirect a student, you have that freedom to walk away from your board and be able to work, it, work the room in any way you want and still be teaching at the same time. And you can also pass it off to a student to do some work from the spot where they're working as well. It's a really neat addition to some of the tools that we already have in our classroom. I'm going to pass it off to um, Lisa Albright. Hi. Um, so I'm going to share with you some of the um, some slides that are from our lessons. So this would be a page that is from um, one of our math lessons. We do, uh, used to be math reflexes. I would just sit there and say, okay, so who can come up and show me on my little Judy clock that they call them, 430. But now I can actually have kids come up. They can um, grab their pen. They can write, it's 430. Um, I can have them clear it, and then I can just tap right here, and instantly I have another uh, time for them to do. So actually, these are all just different times that are set up. They're kind of layered one behind each other. But again, the kids who are on the floor have their own whiteboards, so they can actually participate as well. So while I'm having one child come up here and write the answer, the rest are definitely sitting on the board doing, um, doing the same thing, on uh, writing their answers. They're not just sitting there waiting for their turn. Um, this is the game actually that you saw a picture of and this is Santa Maria using. Um, what's really nice about this is I have everything right here at my fingertips. I'm not fumbling with my everyday math deck. I'm not fumbling with my pieces and a piece of paper. Um, and so behind here, there are num uh, cards that I can pull out that will tell the numbers that I want the children to use. I also have the directions that the kids can read while I'm doing it. But they needed to pull out a number 62. They need to take their marker and put it on a 62. Um, they'll pull out another number. And basically what they need to do is find the difference between 35 and 62. I have quick access to a calculator. So if the kids needed to do, what did I say was, 62, take away 35 to check their answers. Um, and this is also nice, too, because if I, the game has dice, I can instantly show dice, hopefully. Well, it should come up. There we go. And it can roll all sorts of different time, types of things. And I just put the dice on there because I wanted to show you. It's really cool math tools that we have access to. Um, here's a lesson for a page from a word work lesson. Please think that there are really like 40 pages in my lesson. That was just one of them. Um, my word work lesson would be about 10 pages. But we've been working on uh, silent E. So I would ask kids um, who can find the picture that goes with this particular word. Hopefully they would drag the can up. They get a little bit of a reward there. And then we talk about how you can change can if you add the silent E and put it through my magic silent E container here. It turns a can into a can. <laughs> and again, all those things seem like little tricks, but and they are tricks, but they really help keep the kids engaged. It, they love hearing that sort of stuff. And again, they would be on having their whiteboard and changing can into a cane on their whiteboard. Um, I also want to say that this doesn't take away, I know that I was just using dice and things like that, but um, we also have pictures like of uh, base 10 blocks and things like that. I show them on here, but the kids still are actually, when they go off to work by themselves, they're still using those manipulatives. This is not a replacement for manipulatives. It's just a way for me to show it more carefully. Um, and so they can all see it at once. And like Jamie said, they're not looking over and crowding around to see the directions for things. Um, the next slide is about active votes. Um, at your seat or at tables, there are some active votes, which I am going to ask you to try in just a minute. So if you want to grab one of those. But these are some of the benefits of active votes. Um, instant assessment, which I'm going to show you in a minute what that looks like. Um, these, act, these votes are all just for multiple choice things, but it really helps prep kids for those kneecaps that we have to give and all those other different sorts of um, assessments. Um, it really increases engagement and participation. What used to be me just asking a question and one child raising their hand and me just getting the answer from one child, now I have all 18 of their answers. Um, and also it provides safe participation for each student. If you look on the top of your active vote, there's a number. Each child is assigned a number. So when they vote, their names aren't coming up. It's a number that's coming up. So they don't feel like, oh, it's me that got it wrong. Um, and let's see, here's a little pull tab just to show that. 
let's look at some results. So I'm going to ask you right now to actually do one of our questions from our math lesson. Um, the question is, John went to the store with a $5 bill in his pocket. He bought markers for $1.37. How much change should he have? So if you think it's $4.63, type in A and so on and so on. And now you'll see as you vote, it lights right up. Sometimes I can time it if I wanted to see whether the kids can do it in 30 seconds or not. And I'm going to assume everybody who wanted to vote, oh, there's still a few more left. I don't know, 5 and 14 got used? Nope. So I'm just going to stop the voting. And it noticed that one more person did not do it. But here are my results. I can look in a pie graph to see very quickly that most of you chose B, and there were a few people who did not. This is the one that we usually use, that the kids instantly get to see. It's green, that means that's the correct answer. And um, it, the kids like to see the percentage of how many people got it right. But I can go back and see who answered what. So now I can tell who of you got the right answer and who didn't. I can also tell how long it took you to answer. This person took 17 seconds. Um, but it's just great. And all of this gets stored so that I can look at it. And let me show you. Um, I'm going to use our document camera so that you can see. But I can actually save it and I can print my answers. Usually I print it in color. Um, what's that? Um, Um, it's kind of hard to see. Usually they're color-coded. You can s very faintly see that this A and this C are lighter colored. Usually they're green and the red ones are the wrong answers. But I, this one I sorted just by the question that I asked. This was 24, take away 11. And I can see quickly who got it right. I can also sort it by the student. So if I just wanted to see all of number 10's answers. And you can save these over a period of days. So I can look at the end of Unit 3 and see how many times when I did use votes that child got things right or wrong. Um, so I can do it by question, by student, um, and again it just shows me how long it takes them to answer things. So it's really nice data to save and collect and it's data on all the kids. Um, like I said, not just one or two of them from raising their hands. Okay, and I'm not sure, Maria, you're next. Mm -hmm. We also use iPads and iTouches in the classroom, and we don't use them as teaching tools as much as we use them as, for um, practicing tools. Um, the apps on iPads and iTouches are for practicing. They make repetitive practice fun and engaging, and um, we're engaging the learners with repetitive practice. That's kind of repetitive in itself, actually. <laughs> um, we're eliminating worksheets. Um, we are really lucky to have iPads. Here's a child here who's doing some handwriting practice with an iPad. The I uh, touch, a child is practicing math facts. And here, two kids are working together doing research on an iPad. Um, because we, many teachers have these tools in the classroom, we're able to not only use the one that we have, but uh, we're able to share them. For example, in my classroom, um, if I do LH All and ask teachers, to share with me their iPod touches or their iPads. The next morning for my lesson, I could have 15 on my desk, and kids can work in groups or they can work individually to um, solidify math facts, can practice concepts. Um, once again, they're not a teaching tool, but they're a practice tool that are really engaging for the kids. talk to you now about the document camera. Um, you saw Lisa using it a little bit earlier. And what this is really doing is replacing the overhead projector that we always used to use. Uh, there are many benefits of the document camera. The number one benefit really is that it's a live video. So what we're able to do, rather than having to put everything on overhead transparencies like we used to have to do before, if there's something that really can't be copied, now you can actually just slide it right under the document camera and you can see it live. Um, this is a great benefit for showing a lot of things. We've actually showed how to play a game under there before. If you're trying to show kids how to fold origami, that's a great example. But we can also use it for um, using examples of great student work that we wanted to share with the kids. So you can slide anything under there, um, really to be able to present in front of all the kids what you want them to see. 
One of the other huge benefits of the document camera is that we're able to use time-lapse video. And one of the ways that we use that within our classroom is a life cycles unit that we always teach in second grade where we hatch butterflies and baby chicks. So we were able to utilize the document camera last year for this specific purpose because you know the old saying goes, it never works out the way you want it to. And of course, when the chicks are hatching, of course it's gonna happen when you're not in the classroom or overnight when we're not here. So what I was able to do was actually take the document camera and set it up on time-lapse video. I can choose the amount of time um, between each session. And it could be a half hour, it could be an hour, it could be a minute. And really what it's going to do is just take a still photo during that time so we can go back to it when we are back in the classroom and see what happened. So I have a great example. Um, this is one of the butterflies hatching. And of course this video was huge and long and I was able to trim it down to really just the one minute or so that you can actually see the butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. So rather than us spending our day sitting in front of the butterfly cage watching the, the butterfly come out, instead I told the kids, I've set up the document camera, it's going to catch everything that we want to see and we'll come back to it when, when we know that the butterflies come out. So you can see that's uh, just a great example of how we've been able to use the document camera. I'm also going to talk about netbooks and laptops. And as Heidi was saying before, when she was teaching here before, you know, we did have computers in the classroom, but typically there were only one or two. And it made it so that there wasn't as much access for the, all of the kids to be using computers. So what we have now are class sets of netbooks and laptops that we can use the, uh, so the whole class can work together on a project. So I have some examples here. We have a student who's working on a podcast of some work that he's done. We also have a couple kids who are using a netbook to do some research. That's it. We just want to let you know how much we love these technology tools, how much they've totally changed our teaching, and more than anything else, how much they're really engaging students and getting them excited about learning. Thank you. Sure. I have a question. Yeah. Is there a uh, perpetual um, orientation for teachers to uh, learn how to use the uh, um, the active slate in the Ethereum board? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, Lisa and I were actually just over talking we with. Need to repeat um, the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, is there a training happening to keep teachers up to date in terms of our technology, especially the Promethean Board? Um, actually, we were over talking with um, Dr. Z just recently about that, and we'll be starting some more classes going on. It's been over the summer we've been offering some different classes, and people have gone different ways um, in terms of getting their training in the building. Um, we were lucky enough that the school department a couple years ago supported um, some training, and we had some uh, gentlemen fly in and train about eight of us on these who are solid enough to now be supporting our other staff. And that's one of the things that we are doing in, within the, our buildings. And I have to say, just coming into this um, new, uh, using this technology, it's very easy to use. I took a class with Lisa and Jamie. They taught a class this summer, um, which was very informative. And then the Promethean Planet, that, um, the website, actually has tutorials, too, for teachers to use. Um, so it's very... You know, so there's a different, yeah, very teacher friendly. So, um, can you talk about um, how your lesson plans have changed and whether uh, you've used this long enough to be able to say whether you're delivering uh, more education in the same amount of time? Sure. Um, let me see if I can rephrase your question again. You want me to answer kind of the question was um, has it changed my teaching and um, made my lessons more, tightened them up? Is that... Uh, I, I'm, presumably, you're not converting your, your paper lessons to this technology. Right. Presumably, you're using technology to create different lesson plans. Um, but I just want to confirm that. But I think more importantly, have you found, have you used it long enough to be able to see whether you're delivering um, uh, more information, more education to the students in the same amount of time? I, I'm going to say yes. I do feel that I deliver more in the same amount of time. Um, because most of these charts I've created. 
And so I've had to take that time to really plan what it is I want to say, what it is I want the kids to actually be able to read and remember. Um, and the kids are much more engaged, just those active votes. I was am able to get every single one of them to participate in my lesson. Nobody can just sit there and just go, you know, look at the ceiling. And they want to participate. They want to see their answers come up. Their goal is for everybody to get on the green. Um, my lessons are, I want to use the word tighter. There's not as much um, downtime. It's moving the pace is faster, which I think the kids appreciate more. Um, what else? And I think sometimes it is creation of new things, and I think it is our paper lessons. I think we're still delivering the same teaching points, but I think but the teaching points do look different. Mm -hmm. If that was your question, and like Lisa said, I think that clock was a great example. The kids would have been waiting for us to spin that clock every single time to show eight different times. It's just bam, bam, bam. It, it's a lot less wait time for them, and it is tighter teaching for us for sure. Can I also say that, um, especially as a result of the active active votes that we're using as an assessment tool because that assessment is happening immediately and we can check it right away and it's kind of a way for us to gauge how the kids are taking in that that knowledge and what we often find ourselves saying is well you know we noticed that a lot of you got that right let's hear how you got to that answer and I want to know um, what you were thinking to get there and often what we find is that the kids are kind of explaining their thinking in very different ways So we're able to say well, you know Susie was able to figure it out this way But somebody else figured it out another way And so I think that it's really kind of getting at that our brains all work in different ways and that um, We're all going to approach the answer in a different way, but we're all tr hopefully going to get there one more thing too is that um, I think that brain research these days is also showing that um, kids are just learning in such different ways. Their, their brains are almost being trained to um, receive information at a much quicker pace in a more efficient way. And this also is really um, complementary to that sort of thinking that kids are, you know, of the 21st century and are not the kind of um, learners or thinkers that we are and um, we're sort of raising a generation of kids who will learn differently, think differently, and produce in a different sort of way because of the technology that they're being trained with. I want to thank you again. Uh, we have to go upstairs for our real meeting. Good <laughs> <laughs> job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting back to order, um, and, and we'll begin. We'll ask the superintendent now to take the roll call. Yes, Ann Mayer. Carol Chelman. Here. Rebecca Remison. Here. Dexter Legg. Here. Kent LePage. Here. Ann Walker. Here. Mitch Schulman. Here. Tom Martin. Here. Leslie Stevens. Here. Clay Haywood. Here. Linda Brillette. Here. Savannah Fedoro. Here. Very good. Uh, so moving along the agenda on uh, number five, acceptance of minutes. Uh, I'll take a motion to accept September 28, 2010. So moved. Second. Any comment on those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and a motion to accept October 12, 2010. So moved. Second. And any comments or on that? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any opposed? Oh, thank you. <coughs> Uh, there's no public comment tonight. No, I mean, the period, if somebody wanted to speak, we would have one, but I mean, there's nobody here. That would be And we've had our uh, special presentation, unless the press would like to get on this. Uh, so we'll move right into uh, the superintendent's report. Yes, thank you. Um, in your package, you have the latest copy of uh, Board and Administrator for the month of October, as well as the superintendent's update, um, events upcoming in November, highlighting the new bullying law, um, Mr. Zadrovic has worked with Jim Nukas and others and has announced a round of grant funding that will take place. Um, it happened two years ago where teachers are offered an opportunity to apply for a grant. It's a competitive process. The funds come from the Clipper Fund, um, as well as uh, some information about some of the upcoming PD we've planned uh, for folks in the district around uh, technology. And the, uh, the only other item I would uh, remind the board that tomorrow night, I know there's a JBC meeting, but there's also a presentation 
at the Little Theater at 630 around the uh, Wellness Committee and Dr. Rogers on the 5210 campaign. You have materials, uh, documents that are needed for tonight's workshop session. And I'd provide you notice that um, a group of students coming out of the Robert J. Lister Academy will actually be attending Costa Rica in March uh, next year. It's really, a, you'll hear more about it, I'm sure, when Nancy comes and speaks to you, but it's a, it's a really nice integrated thematic project. Um, and students are working on fundraising, they're studying, they have uh, blogs going on, they're tracking, uh, they're learning how to put links on web pages and in and out, and you'll hear a lot more about it, but uh, they'll be attending uh, in March at some point. Some six or seven students are hopeful to attend. And that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. No? Okay. Um, I just want to take a, just back up for one second and take a moment to thank the second grade teachers here at Little Harbor for, for an excellent presentation on uh, some of the new technologies that are here in the building um, and in other elementary school buildings as well, the interactive whiteboard and this whole sort of array of, of other technologies. I thought they did a great job. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank them for doing it and thank uh, Mr. Grossman for helping to organize it. Okay. Uh, so let's move into the workshop. So I'm, I'm going to introduce the process for having a, a bit of a discussion about the comparative metrics documents that's in your board packet. Um, and I'm going to sort of play the role of facilitator in this discussion, and uh, Mr. McDonald will, will be the presenter, so to speak. Uh, and so I'm going to go through, uh, in your packet, there were a couple of uh, pieces I just want to reacquaint you with. Uh, one was what we kind of called homework, and that is to say, uh, rather than have a lot of downtime in this discussion, um, as the protocol would outline, we would want to um, try to uh, have you do some of that reflection beforehand Mike. so that we keep the discussion going. Mike, um, Steve, just pull your mic today. up a little bit. All right. Here we go. So, um, so uh, what I'd like to do is quickly go over the sheet that says tuning protocol in your packet. And uh, this is uh, similar to some of the ways we have collaborative discussions. Teachers have collaborative discussions with each, e with each other, which is always one of the side benefits to us using it is to get a sense of that. Um, and you'll notice that the way this is framed is really for teachers sitting together around student work, uh, whereas we're applying it to a conversation with uh, the work of this comparative metrics document, which is really the text for this discussion. Uh, our goal is to reflect on the comparative metrics and to walk away and have Ed walk away in particular with some feedback on how he might take some next steps uh, around uh, framing that to best meet the needs that you've outlined for this as a, as a comparative document for uh, a number of different indicators uh, for how the district looks. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to him in a minute to do a presentation of the methodology uh, he's used to uh, put this together as well as an overview of what it, uh, what it says. Uh, but I just want to run through the process briefly. Uh, following that presentation, what we want to try to do is stick to um, a progression of questions and a progression of feedback that would go like this. Uh, we would start with some period of just clarifying questions. Uh, that is to say, only questions to clarify uh, a, a step of the methodology or a number on the sheet, not to get into any deeper discussion than that. So it's just purely to uh, make sure we understand uh, the, the numbers and the metrics in front of us, uh, not to start talking about whether they're the right ones or, uh, or was the methodology the right methodology or anything like that, but just a few, a few, sec a few minutes for uh, clarifying questions. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll skip over these pauses to reflect because that was the, the task assigned to you. Uh, and we'll move a little more quickly into um, some feedback. And I'll let Ed sort of set that up uh, in terms of some of the feedback. But on the uh, sheet that you got that was titled the homework sheet were some of the prompting questions that we would hope to hear some feedback around. Uh, that is to say, is there anything that needs to be clarified about the methodology? Does the methodology produce the peer group that seems the most appropriate? Is there anything that needs to be clarified concerning the metrics that are presented? Are the, there metrics that don't seem to give helpful information? Are there uh, metrics that are missing that you think would be more helpful? Uh, what did you learn about Portsmouth schools by reading this? Uh, and what questions did reading this leave you about 
Portsmouth schools. So uh, those are just some of the questions. We don't have to stick necessarily right to that script, but just some of the prompting questions in terms of the feedback. Um, and just usually, uh, as, as per the protocol, we, what we would normally do is start with some kind of uh, positive feedback of how the document that you have in front of you sort of is in line with uh, the goals you would have for this. So what's, what, what's positive about it? Uh, what kind of feedback would you give that, you know, that seems to be on track for what you envision this to, to do? Uh, and then move into more of a probing questions um, and, you know, basically start with the positive and then move into any other questions or, uh, or feedback that would call into question uh, whether this was perfectly in line with what you had hoped. Uh, after that session of feedback, during which um, isn't really um, time we're going to engage greatly with, uh, with question and answer with Ed, but we're really just talking more as a group, uh, we'll have him reflect a little bit at the end uh, and hear his thoughts for uh, what, you know, what are the takeaway points for him uh, in this. So that's kind of the way the uh, protocol is framed. Um, and normally with, a, with a, say, a teacher presenting in this kind of a piece, what you would hope to do is they would leave with a sense of how they might that make that lesson even more uh, effective. You know, if we were doing this with the second grade team we just observed and they were going through a protocol to tune that presentation, they would hopefully leave with some good feedback in terms of how they would actually, um, you know, take what was good and improve on it. So uh, that's kind of the tone we're trying to set. Any questions about the protocol and the process at all? I'm going to turn it over then to Ed to do a presentation of the comparative metrics. So hopefully in your package you have this, this copy here. And it Reminded for folks at home, one of the school board's goals this year is essentially to develop, track, and report out uh, the district's performance against a peer cohort group. So this is an attempt to find um, a group as a starting point um, to, to do some comparative analysis around, be it academic performance, budget, et cetera. And so there's a six-step methodology I use. The first was to just look at districts that were similarly sized. Um, the thought being that they may be constrained as we are, there may be economies of scale or not that are, uh, exist in a district of some 2,600 pupils. And so you see the list of schools that actually fall in the 2000 to 2999 range. And um, I was also asked at, a, at an earlier occasion as to, to look at what might be best in class districts. And so included in there are um, four other districts because they were um, bronze or silver recipients uh, in the U.S. News and World Report last December. So you have Oyster River, Hanover, Dresden, Cole Brown, and Hollis Brookline in that best in class category. So I provided two years of data for you, and you can see that um, in 09010, there are really th three schools that are very close in terms of student population. You'll see that Milford is 105 students higher, Governor Wentworth is 103 students higher in total and Contookook as well as 110. Um, we have, um, Governor, did I say Governor Wentworth? I apologize for that. They're, they're slightly lower. They're down 132 pupils. So they seem to be, when you look at a two-year span, closest to Portsmouth in terms of size. And so the second step was then to go down and look at the poverty indicator to look at the socioeconomics of the district. And typically what the, U, the state uses as a proxy for that is free and reduced lunch. And so again, I provided you two years of data to kind of look there and see how do those that are initially close in size actually match up in terms of uh, free and reduced school lunch eligibility. Portsmouth in 0910 as a total district had 22.35% free and reduced lunch students. When you look at Milford, you see that they're within 2.5%. They're at 19.85. You look at Governor Wentworth, they're much higher by over 10 basis points, 33.18. But Merrimack Valley and Contookook, again, are within a three to four point range in terms of uh, the poverty indicator in terms of districts. So having done those two steps, the third step was to just take a quick look at um, per pupil cost. And arguably, there's different ways to assemble this data or work one's way in. But, but again, I took the two year data as high as the state calculates per pupil cost. What one quickly notices, again, is that um, the best in class in Oyster River, um, in terms of what they spend, they spend about $1,300 more than Portsmouth does per pupil. 
and those other districts that are close, Governor Wentworth and Contokuk, are below by about $1,300 per pupil. Now, there's a range there, obviously, and as I would remind the board, when we look at per pupil costs, the way the state conducts that formula, it's expenditures from any source derived. It's not simply a measure of demand on the local tax base, but it's how it's revenues and expenditures from any source, i.e., grants, Title I, era funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was step three. When we went to step four, again, we, we, we looked at, uh, I lined them up in terms of their enrollment, their poverty indicator, their cost per pupil, and then tried to do an assessment of um, how the community measured up in terms of its relative wealth um, by looking at valuation rates, looking at the level of effort in terms of the tax rate, um, so that you can see when you look at uh, Portsmouth, we have $3.8 billion in uh, assessed valuation. Um, Governor Wentworth is at $4.6 billion. Um, you look at other districts nearby, Merrimack Valley, um, there are less, they're at $1.6, and Contookook is over the $2 billion in assessed valuation. And then you look at what percentage of the tax rate was spent for education, and I did those percentages to look and see. Portsmouth, and, and this is in the 08-09 year, 47% um, of the tax uh, went to local education. That includes the statewide property tax as well as the local uh, education tax. And similar in that match are Governor Wentworth, Contookook, and Merrimack Valley again. Laconia is close to us there, but in other measures, they don't seem to, to, to line up as well or as neatly. And then we looked at step five was to just look at, all right, what are the teacher costs? What's the educational attainment of the teaching force? And what are the total teacher-student ratios, i.e., not just core teachers, but all professional staff divided into the uh, student population in the, in the uh, district? So when one looks at that, we see that um, three out of the four best-in-class districts outspend in, in terms of teacher average salary in 09-010. Oyster River, the average teacher salary is 62199 Portsmouth is at 56737 Similarly, Oyster River and Portsmouth line up in so far as the percentage of teachers who have a master's degree. And we have more teachers who have a uh, uh, CAGS degree or advanced degree beyond the master's um, by some 5%. Only Hanover is the one that outranks all schools in terms of teachers uh, on the high end with a master's or better in terms of that. And when one looks at pupils and all professional staff and does the calculation there, you'll see that on average, uh, Portsmouth is at 10.3 in terms of the staffing ratio. Governor Wentworth is exactly 10.3. Contookook is a little bit higher, 11.2, and Oyster River at 11.5. And so having done those five uh, steps, step six was to simply um, just start pulling some performance data together, and one could go in a thousand different directions in terms of what one might want to look at. I simply took um, things like average class size in those districts, um, I, and I, I basically limited the cohort to Governor Wentworth, Contookook, Merrimack Valley, and the one best in class, Oyster River, because they're running a K-12 district. So if you look at grades one and two and look at average class size, you can see Governor Wentworth is at 14.5 in the uh, 09 10 school year, Merrimack Valley at 17.9, Portsmouth second lowest, 15.7. Ironically, Oyster River in grades one and two and three, four is a little bit higher at 18.6 and 19.6. But you see Portsmouth in that data is pretty much in the middle. If you look at the attendance rates for 08 09, um, we're at 95.2 percent, third ranked amongst that cohort group. Homeschooled students, we have the fewest homeschooled students, 16, where some other districts are up around 121, 115 students who are electing to be homeschooled. That's, I, I shouldn't, I need to be factual here, so I'm going to keep quiet. Uh, the, the, you know, and then, and then and looking at AYP, um, um, not that Misery Loves Company necessarily, but, but, but that you can see that the uh, ever-growing demands to meet the, the uh, ever-increasing targets is placing all districts in difficult situations. Um, only one school, Governor Wentworth, made AYP in reading in 2010, and Merrimack Valley did so in math, but even best in class didn't make AYP in those two categories last year. 
And then I gave you the actual percentages around reading proficiency and math proficiency um, in 2010. And so you'll see Oyster River did outperform. They are best in class in terms of their percentage performance, 81% in reading. And um, I'm losing it here in math, the number, but it's in the 80, 80. 79. Thank you, 79. And um, we're, we're pretty much on average with the others within two or three percentage points in terms of proficiency against those other cohort groups. So that's, that's just a draft. I'll answer any clarifying questions you may have about uh, the methodology to, to lay that out. Uh, how uh, easily is this data collected and from how many different sources do you have to, uh, to collect it? The, the, in, in all honesty, these are largely found on the DOE webpage, and you, can, you just need to kind of pull them out and cut and paste them, so to speak. But there are a whole other data sources on the DOE webpage that I didn't provide here that one could look at. Um, first, this is terrific stuff. Is that a good warm comment? Well, well we saved the warm <laughs> comment until oh. after the clarifying question. Well, then I'll, I'll, with, I'll withdraw that. <laughs> that not be one more, more cool, right? Comment. So, uh, clarifying. Yes. And, and I can ask a question about clarifying data. Mm -hmm. So, um, on page three, could you explain the difference uh, in the student-teacher ratio uh, between the two columns, the first column that says number of teachers, and then the total column that's actually used um, to, to divide against the pupils? What's, what's the difference between those two? It's, it's just three different um, uh, sets of data that the uh, DOE puts together. So, on the first one, they're just showing what the average teacher's salary is. In district. No, no. I'm, what I'm saying is that so for Portsmouth, for example, the number of teachers uh, it's inconsistent, is isn't it? Yeah. And then, and then, but we're we're using 236, and I noticed in most cases it goes down. It goes down, but not all cases. But but, can, what's going on there? That's a great question, and you'll. I've said the same thing in terms of uh, when I put the data together and then looked at that. Why does that number change? Because in some districts it doesn't. Most of them it does. But that's but how that's, it's reported on the DOE webpage. So okay. it was. It's. All right. so, I don't know the answer to that, Dexter, in all honesty. And so my other questions are related to more data. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, is the salary information available um, from other districts on paraprofessionals or administrators or other, other school employees, or is it strictly teachers? I, I think we can get it, but it's not on the DOE webpage, but I can grab that. And, and then a further question on again doing because what the trouble is this actually leads to the to the need for more information mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge on this mm -hmm. stuff but um, on page two um, I, I understand how the, the per pupil cost is derived um, but do we know uh, for other districts what the ratio is of general funds to special funds um, we, we have about a 10% special funds to, to, to overall revenue, but do we have that information from other districts? We can get it. Because I think that would be helpful because th then you begin to pull just it learn, out pull it and out and, and, and learn a little bit more about what some of the cost drivers are. Thanks. Sure. Mm -hmm. But this is really good stuff. So, so, the, um, so any other clarifying questions? Because I think there are, there are a lot of discussion points that we can go into uh, with what's here, what's not here, and um, Kent. Okay, clarifying points, and I guess also going somewhat into what is and isn't here, follow a little bit up from what Dexter is saying is, is that, you know, it's, it is um, classroom teachers versus the non-classroom teachers. Uh, I mean, if I look at actually page four, um, and you have the average class size in public uh, uh, elementary schools, the, the variance there, and I think that's just a clarifying of what it is. Along with that is that um, under your uh, homework questions here that I took, are there metrics that don't seem to be, uh, I say, helpful or, or helpful information? Is, is that I'm not sure whether it's classroom teachers and or whether these districts may or may not have uh, something such as a uh, tech center, uh, busing, uh, special ed ratio. I don't see, and did I miss that there is, is there a special ed ratio that we, we could use in some uh, manner? Then, as much as we pride ourselves in the part about uh, homeschool being extremely low, 
Uh, I think a, a, a number that I would like clarified out there um, is number of students that we lose both in SAU 50 and 51 to private schools. And it, I would assume there is a, a, uh, a matrix out there on the DOE stating, you know, this is the number of students that are in Portsmouth and we know that X is going to uh, private type schools. So, you know, do we compare, uh, you know, to Hanover or whoever on that? So that'd be a kind of a clarifying one because we, we've only taken out that section of homeschooled. To me, what you know, clarifying is is that well, what about the students we don't have? I think that's the big question on that one line. Um, and this is one that's always gets me when we do do this type of comparison is that we're missing the either the national or regional type level. And, and I apologize as I read this. I'm, Trying to think, is there a national and, uh, and or regional? Because we test regionally uh, with, with other states. Uh, is, there, is there a matrix out there that would do a regional, if not also then a national, and saying that that's where the averages might be? And, and again, having you know uh, similar type schools such as Marshwood, uh, York, and uh, uh, um, even Trape and then Newburyport to the south that have a similar type programming and or student base, I, I'd be curious whether that matrix could be utilized into it because their, their, their influences are there also upon our community. Those are the ones I need to clarify that I think more than anything as I looked at it for homework. Uh, other questions, questions, clarifying questions, questions you want Ed to answer right now? One of the other thoughts I have is just looking at other New England states to understand you know, we've got a segmentation here of New Hampshire, but are there things that uh, other states are experiencing? So not necessarily cross-border, but really taking a look at you know Rhode Island, Connecticut, Mass, and not saying we need to grab uh, one from each state, but just wondering are there some differences uh, out there that uh, maybe lend uh, some kind of a, a particular lens that would allow us to look at something differently? Uh, and then also, um, you know, we have three elementary schools, a middle and a high school and a, and a, a Lister Academy. You know, are the costs different because we have, uh, in a sense, running uh, six building operation? And are these other schools running three building operations, you know, or eight building operations? So, uh, you know, trying to add one more metric. And there's a, a lot of other ones that I start, you know, coming into, but it's more about just understanding, you know, what data is available. Um, this data um, you probably can't get from the state, but um, I was just curious. Uh, under the uh, districts of similar size on the uh, first page, if you start um, calculating from the kindergarten on up or, or preschool on up, it's, it's obvious that in Portsmouth, and this is just uh, something to think about, um, we have the highest amount of students in, in the high school. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that uh, that the average parents in, in Portsmouth are, are probably around the age of 36 and, and older. Um, I think you might want to keep that in, in your heads as well. Um, that's all I have to say. Um, just, Ed, if you could clarify um, under valuation and local tax, Mm -hmm. um, where you say Portsmouth spends less than 50% of the total local tax for education. Mm -hmm. Conversely, Worcester River spends 71% of its local tax in education. Could you just clar comment on that? Sure. So that's the 0809 tax rate that's published on the DOE <coughs> website. Mm -hmm. and, and in that year, um, you had uh, $5.72 per thousand evaluation for local ed, $2.32 in uh, the statewide property tax total tax bill per thousand valuation was seventeen dollars and nine cents. So if you add this local and state ed together, mm -hmm. you spent forty seven percent of your tax bill per thousand evaluation on education. So it should be local and state tax. Yes. Okay, because yeah. it just says local. Yeah, well then I need to correct that, I'm sorry. So we'll move into some uh, feedback now and, and
and uh, obviously questions can continue, especially questions that are more, you know, out there for, for the food for thought. Um, and, and Ed will continue to take notes, and we'd like him to sort of report back of his uh, takeaway points from our discussion uh, at this point. So, I'm, I'm, I think this was a terrific document. Uh, you know, this is uh, the first time that we've actually gotten our hands around uh, some real numbers that uh, provide a, a couple different things. And there's really, you know, to me, this data serves two different. Uh, uh, purposes. One, you know, it, it enables us to go out into the community and you know, have a real report card that uh, stack ranks you know, where we're doing. Um, the missing piece that I'm trying to you know, get my hands around are, is, you know, what do we actually do with this uh, data? You know, aside from you know pre presenting it out there as a report card, uh, but in terms of actionable you know uh, information, as well as trying to find some insightful. Uh, pieces of information, some nuggets that would sit there and say, you know, Governor Wentworth School District is doing this. You know, this is why their numbers have come up here. You know, there's there's nothing that suddenly you know, gives us insight as to how these numbers are built for all these other schools. Um, uh, so quantitatively, you know, we're on the mark. You know, we've got a lot of data, but in terms of drawing conclusions as to, you know, what are other school districts doing that we could potentially learn from uh, and change what we're doing. Um, is is one of those pieces uh, that uh, you know, I'm kind of uh, stuck with. The, the question that I'm posing out there is, is what do we do with the data? Um, when I read this um, page two, the principal cost and then the bottom part that explains what the people cost is, I'd like to see that first because I went straight for the numbers and I think people often go straight for the numbers and per pupil cost and I think the explanation of it really should come first because I think we get a lot of questions around budget time about what does that mean that that's what it costs to educate one of our kids and that's not what that number is used for at all so I think we need to be really explicitly clear in what that number is and the explanation I think maybe should come first that Portsmouth spent 47% of its budget on education, whereas Oyster River spent 71%. Uh, there was a time years back when that was the amount that Portsmouth spent on education. And, and then it suddenly zoomed down to a lot, 40%. So I, I think that's mm -hmm. a very telling, very telling number. Dexter. So, um, Ed, this is great stuff. Well, thank you. This is, this is um, it, it's a great starting point. I think um, two thoughts. One is, although we should think about adding some districts, um, I think at the end of the day, what we're really trying to use this for is to figure out how we can improve our performance. And, it's, it, and the performance is improved along a couple of dimensions. One, it's, it's the outcomes of, of the students. I mean, are they achieving what we want them to achieve? And, and I would say, based on this, we're doing okay, but, but there's room to grow. And the other dimension is um, value. Are, are we getting the right value for, for what we're spending? And to Tom's point, um, how can we learn from, from other districts, either best of breed or districts that look like us that are having some successes, to improve um, how we're spending our resources? And so, Although there may be a tendency on this thing to add more stuff to learn more about the broad landscape, um, at the end of the day, I think what we want to do is identify some areas where we can really drill down um, in real detail to understand a few key things. Because the reality is that um, administration has limited resource, and if you had a group of, of, of 10 analysts, you could go to town on this, but we don't have a group of 10 analysts. So we need to be careful, I think, as a group of asking what we want the administration to do on this. But I think if it's still driven to those two mm -hmm. outcomes, are, are we using our resources in the best way possible to, to achieve, um, to, to increase the, the, the performance of our students? But, but this is a great, great, great stuff. I mean, I, you, guys, um, you guys deserve an awful lot of kudos for beginning to put this together, because it'll help the conversation 
and all of us will be better informed uh, and the community will be a lot better informed in this. So, um, I mean, well done. I agree with Dexter. I think when you add more and more and more, it gets a little bit overwhelming and then you lose the primary <coughs> message. Um, one thing I think that we need to think about is every year we get asked the same questions, the same five or six questions from city council. And if we go back to those five or six questions, at the end of the day, we need to be answering those questions. And one of the, 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 one of the questions is, what does per pupil cost mean? The other one we always get asked about and we get caught in from some of the city councilors is, we have 10.3 teachers for every, 10.3 students for every teacher. Um, and that's really not accurate. And so maybe we need to, I think we need to just be really careful how we present that and be clear about what a real teacher is versus what some of the other roles are and how we're coming to that number. Because um, I think that can be a dangerous number. But I think that's one of the questions we get asked over and over again. So maybe in thinking about this, looking at those questions we get every year from city council to inform some of this data. And this, I agree, this is awesome. Another question. And, uh, and Kevin, another question. Um, so I, I said don't increase the, the span of this thing, but it would, it would help, I think, us on the, on the, um, the average salary for our teachers to understand a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Um, what is wh I mean? What is the driver of all of those? I mean, is it is it um, just contraction? Is is, no, is, it, is it length of experience? Is it the quality of the teachers? In other words, that they ha have more advanced degrees, um, seniority, um, and the other thing that would be helpful, although it goes outside our cohort, is because at the end of the day, um, we're trying to attract talent. Uh, it may be helpful to look at area schools just in that one dimension, mm -hmm. because it would seem to me that. Um, we're not necessarily drawing um, talent from the northern part of the state. We're, we're trying to compete for teachers who want to live in the seacoast. And so it may be helpful to look at the immediate towns. And I would, in fact, would, would go into York uh, and, and some of the uh, uh, Marshfield because, the, the, again, those teachers are saying, I want to live in the seacoast. You're, you're trying to attract the best from that group. It may be helpful to have that information so we better understand what the driver is there, or drivers are. Just, just on salary, because, because, because those are different school districts in so many ways. But on the salary dimension, I mean, we, we're, we're competing in the marketplace for, this, for those teachers. So on that one dimension, it may be worthwhile. You, we may learn something. We may not. I agree. Kent. Um, again, it's, it, it's a great start uh, beyond... Uh, what we've probably ever had to help us start to have a better understanding of the numbers. Where I find the biggest downfall, and when I read this over the weekend, because there is a downfall to this, is that this is the numbers. And I think what we, what are, what are we about? Not just the Portsmouth School Board, but the Portsmouth School System. We're not about the numbers. We sell an education to every 2,000 plus students that we have here. And what is the final outcome after 13 plus years? What we, and we're not alone in this. What happens to that population we had responsibility for 13 plus years if they had a child of special needs? It can be, you know, the three years prior to that and some with special needs X amount of years after that. Because we produce a product. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not a clear product. But everyone who gets to the uh, senior year of high school is given a diploma. And the diploma is only as good as what, the, what we produce during that. The, the numbers are needed. The numbers are needed to sell it towards uh, uh, city council. Then they're needed to sell towards the public. But what is it that it, e it equates to? And it equates to a child. And the child is what we have at the very end. And there's a lot of variables in during that might be uh, good to have in there. How many kids are doing activities? How do we keep kids engaged in, 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 in things such as whether it be sports, whether it be band, because uh, those are important things that when it comes budget time, they get, on the, they get on the chopping block beforehand. And guess what? If you didn't have band and you didn't have uh, some athletics and you didn't have certain things, when we get to that end year of the senior year, and I don't know how you measure this or how you equate this to it, how many kids go to an Ivy League, you know, it isn't as much as an Ivy League school, it's how long do we get them 
you know, how many of our students, and I'm sure we can get the data, get a two-year, four-year, go into the military, uh, get a doctorate, get, get something along that line, six years out. And I think that's what we've produced. You know, these are the numbers. What have we produced? We don't know what we've produced because when we get to the senior year, we sort of say, thank you very much, here's your diploma. But the more important part is, what did those students do as contributing uh, citizens to the world? And I think this, this gets us to the numbers. Now we need to put those numbers and say, guess what, Portsmouth, guess what? We produce 60% uh, of kids go and get a four-year degree. And they are able to be contributing, uh, and you know, that's been the long-standing uh, thing, make them contributing. Uh, citizens in the in the in the world, not just in the Portsmouth community. So that's the only again, excellent document. But what's the end? So I just have a couple of uh, quick questions then. Um, so I, I agree that uh, the teacher information chart, in terms of all teachers, average number of teachers, total pupil ratio, that's a little confusing. So I, I do think that, that that needs to be clarified. Because in a sense, the way I'm looking at it, and tell me if I'm wrong, so we have 236 that we're counting teachers. So that really means we have 236 adults who have a teacher contract. Is that what that number is? I'll check with the state exactly why there's variance there. Because that don't really know what the variance okay. is. It's within 10, but it's, we're not alone. No, okay. So that no, that really needs alone. to be clarified. Yeah, yeah I don't um, because uh, because when they when you look at the 10 to you know the 10.3 pupil to, uh, to total teacher ratio, and then you look at the class sizes, it doesn't match. So it really would no. help to clarify that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, one of the things that the state has always said, and I, part of the reason I like uh, the way in which you've narrowed down to our cohort, is because even though there are other districts that have equal numbers of students, they also, they may not have, and in some cases it's true, they don't have a middle school. So that's not a fair comparison, and that's what the state has always said. You should do across the board. So I worry a little bit about going out of state, although I agree with Dexter, the money issue makes sense because it's not a far commute from Maine to Portsmouth to somebody to work over in Elliott as opposed to here because they might be paying more. Um, but I worry about comparing us to other, other districts outside of the state. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I'm not sure what you're going to be able to draw from that if you look at those numbers because there just might be too many questions and too many reasons not to understand what the comparison really is. <clears throat> um, the other thing is I think, you know, this is going to be a great uh, document for us to be able to begin to really, as Leslie said before, answer some of the same questions we're always asked by the City Council. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I would think historically if we consider this a uh, baseline, uh, although we've had a number of documents in the past, some of which have also been excellent, but not quite to this extent, you know, then we'd be able to actually have a history of this information for the community. You know, because I know people in the past, especially during budget times, they've always accused the district of being, we're overstaffed, we spend too much money, we're heavy on administration. Well, here's an opportunity to look at the cohorts that we picked that seems to make sense to be our cohorts, and then look at that kind of data as well. Not to say, you know, we're lower just because we're lower, but now we have some information that's, you know, that's out there that's real that says we're not necessarily overstaffed. So, you know, I think the ability to begin to get that kind of comparative data besides just the, the budget numbers, I think that's really going to be very helpful. Um, and I also wonder how many of these other cohorts in uh, districts in our cohort have a career tech center. I don't know if many do. There's only, I think, 19 in the state. Mm -hmm. but, you know, so we have, ele we have elementary, regional. middle, high, and a career tech center built in, oh whereas some of these others don't. And, you know, we also have many incoming tuition students from the areas. Mm -hmm. Many of these don't as well. But I would just want to say, I think, as everyone is, I just want to echo what everyone said. I think it's a great document. I think there could be a little bit more information over time that can be added. Um, it's a wonderful place to begin, and I think it's a great public document. Uh, for, for people, and I think it's to me it seems like right now that this is this this might just be the right cohort. You know, maybe you can find another district here or there, but this this seems to be a fair example of people who would be districts that would be com comparable to us. So, yeah. I just wanted to comment that I was uh, I was surprised by the uh, free and reduced schedule, where we stood in that. I I was surprised at how high some of the other districts were. That you wouldn't expect to be. In the, in the data, I shouldn't 
it, mm -hmm. it has increased and we've gone up again. We're 26 percent as a district oh, it's up this to, year. Wow. And I was also surprised at um, our really good attendance rate, because that's really uh, that's really uh, excellent. And and the small number of uh, homeschooled that that was very surprised. That this is great. Mm -hmm. Yes, Carol. I did know that you know this is a great start, and I think it's excellent. Um, my other comment would just be a little bit along the lines of what Kent was saying. Um, I think this is a little bit light on achievement, mm -hmm. like Kent was saying. I'd like to see more about what are our kids doing. Are they going to Ivy League schools? Are they going to four-year colleges? Are they going into the military? Right. I mean, this, this is all very interesting information, but I don't really know, because that's really the question. The question is really how are they doing? And if there's some way we can really tap into that, um, then, then we can make judgments as to whether we're getting value for our money. Yeah, so that, that would be my comment. Well, we have the list from graduation. Right. Sure. I guess my thought was, I wasn't sure we were at the point in the conversation where we, you wanted to hear all of the things that we think are missing. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly where we are. Okay. So we would, you know, keep going. I guess the, the, just to continue off, um, again, what we're hoping is uh, walk away from this with, with clear feedback for what we would add or take away uh, so yeah roll that right in well in that case I would I would absolutely agree that that kind of data is important I also think if you you know if you were to put all of this across a very longer grid than you've been able to create on a small piece of paper I understand that you know but I would be interested to see what, uh, what the mobility rates of these other districts are as well uh, the, I would like to see what the SAT scores of these other districts are as well um, I'd like to see what the, how many administrators they have uh, within that district. Uh, I think uh, Kent's point earlier about having some SPED data. Um, how many? What's the percent of, percentage of coded mm -hmm. students in in these districts to yeah. see how we compare? I agree with Carol. You know, post secondary enrollments, number of graduates, um, that whole kind of thing. Uh, I also think that. Um, you know, I would like to, just just at the high school level, for example, just to get a sense of, like, we have a particular kind of high school program. So do any of these schools have an international baccalaureate program? You know, because if, if, that might be something that contributes to possibly a higher achievement level and a lower expenditure because it's a different kind of an approach. So that kind of thing, a number of AP courses that are offered and also the percentage of money spent in each district on technology that goes into the classroom. Um, and then there's a bunch of qualitative data that's harder to, 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 this is a silly statement, qualitative data that's harder <laughs> to quantify. <laughs> you know, but for example, I mean, we're struggling with it, our, with, it, with it ourselves in terms of how is our technology organized in the, in the district. So I'd be curious at some point, when you look at these other districts, how is their technology organized? How is, what kind of staffing levels do they have for that? You know, those kind of questions. Um, because that's sort of an area we're moving into, so. Yes, Kent. I, I, I want to go back to, again, an end result. And I think we can do this with maybe George Cushing and, and, and the SAU. Is, again, that number that goes off, and, again, I know there's private schools that are below the eighth grade, but the majority of students what we lose uh, to go to private school is that eighth grade going into their freshman year. And I think we could do, you know, finally partner up with a private school. Maybe it's St. Thomas this time, and maybe, maybe it's two. You say, how well prepared, and I th again, I would like to do this w with SAU 50 and 51, I think, how well prepared were they when they went there? I mean, you know, Phillips Exeter is, is a little bit more uh, 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 of a challenge to get into than, than St. Thomas to a degree. Uh, and, and again, those are the products between our school systems that prepared a child. Because again, we don't want to cut off our nose despite our face, by the time they get to the eighth grade, we've prepared students that go to some very prestigious uh, private schools within this area. So, that's you know, right. that's that, it'd be nice to know that number uh, because they were our responsibility. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Stephen. So now, uh, Ed will just reflect on some of the things. <laughs> reflect away. I'm facilitating the next uh, <laughs> <laughs> workshop session.
First of all, I think uh, this is your document, and um, admittedly, not knowing whether you would agree to the cohort, um, I stopped. I just didn't go any further right. until I got feedback. Mm. But I think um, the points about getting exit data is, you know, is absolutely right on the money. I think that's ultimately how we measure success. They come through our system. Where do they go, et cetera? Had we gotten the grant that uh, Principal Collins applied for, we would have joined, uh, had dues paid to the National Clearinghouse. So we can start that process. We certainly know intentionally what students are intending to do upon graduation, what percent are going to four-year, two-year, military, et cetera. We can pull that data, SAT data. That's all high school profile data. Mm -hmm. We can, I can, that's, that's easily done. So that's, that's good advice. In terms of um, um, the other pieces around SPED, um, administrative staffing levels, looking at high school programs, I, we can, that's, all that data, I can come back and give you a second iteration. I'm, I'm happy to do that. The um, you know in terms of the purposes um, and, and what this is what this is intended to do is just so we're not in a vacuum. I mean you know how are we doing is measured against people who are confronted with the same uh, economic climate in the same region, um, and what's our performance? And you know um, so the in, the intent of the total teachers into staffing was just to suggest that we're not out of whack in any. If you take all professional staff measured into population of pupils, we're right there. We're not over. We're not under. You know, a part of this exercise, what I heard from board members when I first came on board, was you know we don't know if the porridge is too hot or too cold or just right, and that and this gives you some other pieces of data to pull in to say. Now, right. right. Well, and then you can look at performance and say there's room to grow, yeah. there's room to move, and you can, and then you can. I think you know, somebody said about drilling down in particular areas to find out, you know, what is Governor Wentworth doing that makes them successful in meeting AYP and mathematics, you know, uh, or we can answer a lot of questions. I think once we have a cohort done. So, I, I collected all of it. I won't go over all of it. I can look at the salary regionally in terms of the sea coast and go across the border in Maine. That's data I can mm -hmm. get my hands on, and it's fine. And so, yeah. a few, I know a few. So, so I'll come back and pre present a, a second draft a little bit later. Give us about a month's time, and we'll give you a, a second look at this. So, thanks for the feedback. It was good. Okay. Question. Text in, yes. So, uh, you began to um, just pick four, four examples as you began to drill a little bit farther down. Um, I don't know if those are the right four or not, but it makes sense to begin to limit it as you get more information. But as you look at our cohort list, are, are there schools that either by reputation or by knowledge, um, not Oyster River, because we know they, they're in there for benchmarking purposes, but for our pure cohort group, are there, do we, do we know that there are, just by reputation or by knowledge, that some really are um, examples that we really do want to um, really understand? Or, or not, I just throw out the question, mm -hmm. um, because at some point, um, and maybe it's Oyster River is the example, or maybe you pick an example for each, um, a, a different one for elementary school as, as high school, but um, if there are best of breed out there that we can get to that fundamentally are operated in our environment, because right or wrong, New Hampshire is still a different environment than Massachusetts or Connecticut. But if we can identify those, we really should really understand them. I mean, in, in business, what you do is you understand the best of breed and you tear it apart. And you understand how they do it, um, what their processes are, what their cost structures are. Um, you might not necessarily replicate them, but you want to understand them. Mm -hmm. And, and um, if we're really going to do this exercise to come out with how do we want to improve ourselves, do you find a cohort that has a middle school that we think is best of breed and you compare it to our middle school. They may not do stuff as well as we do. They might do some stuff better than we do. Um, and you do the same for a high school. Mm -hmm. And I think you do the same for an elementary school. Not this round, Ed, but I mean, at some point, okay. you, you get there mm -hmm. um, if we're going to learn from this thing. Yep. So that, I mean, that may be, you know, that may be something, that may be a 2012 exercise um, that you assign you, you assign people on your staff. Um, um, Steve, you're, you're going to become the expert in um, the, the, the high school for Oyster River or, or whoever it is. Go find out everything about them. 
and you give someone else an elementary school. Okay. Yes. It, it, to sort of just, you know, because this is our budget work session. And one of the things is, is that we're now at the end of October. We've done two great sessions of, of trying to gather us on this. And I don't want to, I guess we're all hoping that we don't have another budget season like we always do. We get there, and we don't know what the city council may bless upon us. And, and, and I think, you know, a, a, a joint letter from the, school board to, uh, from the school board to the city council saying, we've been preparing, you know, information. We'd like to maybe pass these drafts along or information, maybe not the whole thing. But I really hope that they'll give us a number much earlier and not as the budget ends and not as the budget has been passed and then say, here's your number. I, I, you know, we can only work with that. And I, I've had discussion with a few city councilors, and I've got to be quite honest, I was a little depressed, you know, that, you know what, what the thought is out there. And I hope that that doesn't come to fruition. But, you know, here we are in October, which means November and December are our last two months that we won't be up to our eyeballs into budget discussion, and yet we never have that miracle number. And, and, and again, we were 1.7, I think I asked Steve, from 1.8 last year, 1.82 last year. The feeling that I've already gotten from a couple is we'll be lucky to see that. And I, and I would hate that upon our students and on our public, it, it, especially where we're doing this pre-programming. And I think we need to share it early on with them that we want information early on too. We, we give them information early, maybe they'll give us. We can hope they'll give us something. This is an election year next year. You know, so that kind of raises a question for me. One of the conversations I think over the next couple of meetings for us really is, so as we look, talk to the administration about help to, to asking them to construct a budget, and this was the problem we had last year, not knowing what that number is, but we know what it costs roughly to remain level funding. So how do we ask them to construct the budget? Do we say we want you to, not level funding, I mean level services, we know what that costs. Do we do what we did last year, which is that's what we know what it costs and we'd like to see that budget, or do we say, well, let's go there. What did you say, the uh, September, the- um, 1.8, one, two. So do we end up you know, suggesting those kind of numbers? And at the same time, I think, you know, this is just my personal feeling here. You know, the, the administration is putting together some, and we'll talk some more about it, a strategic plan as to how to move forward to help improve a, a achievement through best practices, through professional learning communities, given the, mon the budget that we have. They're trying to implement that whole new strategy and move it forward. And at the same time that they're trying to implement the strategy, we're trying to think about, well, can you do that if we cut a million dollars out of your budget? You know, how do you yeah. implement your strategy at the same time that you're asking them to cut? And within that environment, how do you construct the budget? So that's really the difficult situation we have coming up. Because they're not going to yeah, give us a but, number but ahead I, of time. I, I think, Mitch, I, I agree. I think we have a budget, but we don't own a budget. The budget we don't own the budget. We don't exactly. own the budget. But we, have, we do own the programming and the services yes. of the schools. So we the need process. to do what we see those practices are and I say this is, this is it, and this is the cost of it, guys. If you want to eliminate it, that comes on your shoulders. Well, but then it's incumbent upon us to do as best a job as we can to sell it to the community to it's say important. that this is a reasonable, whatever it ends up being, that this is a reasonable budget and we have a plan in place and, you know, the superintendent has put it forward and, you know, we'll hold them accountable. So, I mean, it's tough. I know it's tough. Anyway, Stephen. So I was just going to say it's a kind of a nice, uh, we set up the workshop and we sort of just talk. So it's kind of a nice segue into the uh, article reading uh, in your packet on effective resource strategies. Uh, I know Ed was going to go over an overview of some of the work around that. And well, this is just, a, again, I think another data point. I think it's just another way for the board to feel some level of comfort around how do we budget and are we appropriately resourced, inappropriately resourced, et cetera. And so, this chapter six, you read, you read about the three key strategies that are critical for schools, and Linda shared an article with me this evening that's right on point that I'll share with you at our next meeting. But when, when we talk about um, school level programs and educational strategies that research shows clearly impact positively student learning, 
I created a list from that article. These, these are the, my notes around that, and it's all day K. It's smaller class sizes with a goal of 15 and grades K to 3. You know, folks get nervous about what are we talking when we talk about the instructional core. You will see that in this article they talk about art, music, physical education. These pieces are all part of the core and sustaining those providing teachers the, the daily planning time, uh, added PD days, but the, the areas we're looking at closely in terms of reallocation of resource is, is items uh, six, seven, and eight, i.e., you know, it's, it's fine to put teachers in PLC groups, send them outside, but one of the things we know is the, jo the job embedded professional development is the way to go. To have a trusted colleague, somebody that's respected, help you implement that curriculum i.e., you can call it a coach, a facilitator, an expert in the content area. That's, that's an area that that article suggests needs to be in place. When you look at extensive use of formative assessment, you saw some illustration tonight with the, with the little devices, et cetera, but that's critical, and that's the good work that, that this district's been engaged in for two or three years under uh, Mr. Zadrovic's leadership. And then the other piece is finding that extra time to provide students more one-on-one -on -one tutoring, extended day, in other words, taking the school day vertically and also expanding it horizontally. And we're working on creating a more collaborative cal uh, professional school culture. So these are just resource guidelines. And, you know, it, it gives you a, a framework under adequacy to look at how are we staffed. And this is adequacy. This isn't the Cadillac. This is just meeting, you know, theoretically what's required to deliver state standards to 100% of students. And so they give you that prototypical school, um, much, it's, it's, it's within 35 or 40 pupils of Little Harbor to see how they're staffed. And you can, you can use that ratio there and do the math. I've done the math, and quite frankly, um, the full staffing levels, classroom, there'd be a couple more, but reallocating resource where, where Little Harbor is staffed at the same levels this adequacy guideline would suggest. You might reallocate some resource a little bit differently to get your instructional coach to structure some extended learning time to provide a robust summer school program, but the staffing's pretty close. We've done the similar thing with the middle school and high school, and, and we're, we're a little bit higher at the middle school, but quite frankly, I think it's no surprise to the board that we run a strong unified arts program that's been part of the, 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 the um, planning for the middle school, construction, et cetera. And I think CTE drives the high school up a little bit higher. But, you know, I've done that. I didn't want to confuse you with a lot of data, and I can, I can share that with you and how, how this prototypical adequacy level of funding matches up with our current schools. But I think it's important, again, that the school board have some firm, uh, your legs underneath you when you're confronted in the community about uh, myths and misperceptions about where we are as a district. And, and so this is aligned with best practice. It's 28 states across the nation and how they've looked at this. And so um, I don't, I'll happy to answer any questions. I, didn't, I know it's getting late, um, but, but I think this is a, another framework to help the board make sense of uh, the task ahead. Next so did, did you say you did that not just for staff levels, but also for the costs on this list as well? Well, no, I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't, I just did it in terms of uh, resource, resource okay. levels, Dexter, right? Um, I, that, that would be another terrific window and, and benchmark to, to go through that um, for all the schools, for all the costs, because again, it gives us a sense of, of is it too sure. hot? Is it too cold? Right. Is it yeah. just right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, along these dimensions. And so um, that's a, this is terrific to have this data. And so what, as we talk to principals and they start to develop their budget, the conversation we're having, okay, is how are we going to, um, within the existing framework, i.e. in a revenue neutral way, look at items six, seven, and eight? What, what, what are we doing to, to capitalize on that and get aligned with that? Um, and people are being responsive. I mean, there's a lot of uh, thought going on, but... Um. So you're saying to, to stay within current resource levels, how can you make that happen? Exactly right. Move things around. Right. Change. And I mean, not change the, you know, turn it on its head immediately, but what... No, no. You know, move in that direction. Exactly.
clarify. I think we're off the protocol. Off the protocol now. Just let it deal with Mitch. We have to follow Doctor Z's. Doctor Z taking off. We're into section two. This, yeah, this delves into a broader discussion because, you know, as we take a look at all the work that's been done on the comparative metric piece, you know, this really suddenly says if we have more time and we're looking inward and we decide to really take a look and, and let's just say whatever the budget comes out the point is is that we're going to have a finite amount of money and if we look at things on a per pupil basis you know the really you know the idea is you know one is we're able to look at things in relative magnitude you know we're boiling things down to you know it only costs us two dollars per child to deliver this well that's not so bad you know, or we need to cut two dollars off of this program to deliver it. Um, you know, per unit cost of various services will allow us to identify. Well, I think Dexter was going to say out of whack spending on a. You know, well, we can deliver it in second grade over here, but in this school, we're it's it's much higher. Why? You know, what what are the inconsistencies? You know, and also looking at performance. You know, things of that nature. Um, and probably most importantly, I think this year is going to be a matter of saying if we know what the cost is. You know, we will then have the tool to uh, evaluate trade-offs. You know what, I really want this one versus this one. This is more important. You know, we need to affect uh, achievement level in reading. So I, I would rather take the resource over here and spend it over here. And if we have that metric, then I think we have the ability to have the discussion, to be able to sit there and say, you know what, math is more important than X. And I won't say what it is because, you know, that's uh, you know, for us to decide. But uh, you know, and, and then also just, you know, it, it allows the budgetary process to become a little bit more uh, controlled because then we're talking tangible numbers and we're not talking these, you know, expansive numbers. We're talking about, you know, incrementally down to, you know, X number of dollars per student we're going to increase. Um, and so, you know, I don't think we're uh, there uh, at, at that level yet, but, you know, you mentioned things like, you know, Let's take a look at uh, you know administrative staff. You know, are we you know sized correctly at some of our cohorts and looking at uh, you know achievement level and looking at you know uh, math specialists and reading specialists uh, because you know there's a lot of things that are out there that maybe are going to you know crack that window into seeing what someone else is doing that maybe we could be doing differently. Um, but I think you know the first step is is maybe looking departmentally and then maybe trying to take a look at something. Uh, that you know would enable us to make a better decision because we'll know what that incremental cost could be. I know that's a, a mouthful, but you know I just think this is a great direction that we're moving in, uh, and it's only going to enable us uh, to make better decisions because we'll be able to actually talk about the issue at hand and and understand the trade-offs. I, I think this is basically what we've already done to some extent. Your point that you know putting resource where it's needed because when we added the half reading at Little Harbor at that particular grade level because of the large number of students, uh, that was that was what needed to be done. You know, it was the larger class numbers than than we should have, and we were doing the same thing previously at John Darrow when there was a large uh, a large cohort of kids. So it's kind of what we're trying to do and have, but we're just starting. Oh, absolutely. But this is now more metric. You know, you exactly. Can, you got something that's going to factually base it and say, you know, I mean, so the conversation could also go to say, if we're going to spend X amount of money on the track club and we're going to, and it's going to be $2,000 per pupil to do this one thing to, you know, refinish the track, and you could say we could do something else that's only going to be $12, you know, maybe you sit there and say, you know what, we can't afford $2,000 per, you know, because we only have 40 kids in the track team, you know, to do that kind of an upgrade. We'd rather spend it over here. So I, you know, I'm with you. Dexter. Um, the, the only point I'd make is when we're looking at the cost numbers, not so much the staffing numbers, um, just make sure that the costs are reflect 2010 costs. And I'm not sure, I mean, some of, I, I don't know what the source of this is and how recent the data is, but we don't want to, we don't want to misrepresent it. Right. want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. That's right. I know you, you'll, and you'll do that. But. Um, Ed, you don't need to comment on this tonight, but at some point I'd like to know more about this idea of extending the school day, you know, where that's coming from, what the research is that's behind that idea, and, and um, how much that would cost us. Would it cost us anything to extend the day? Um, what would be the implications of the union? You know, all the different issues 
surrounding extending the day. And I still think that if we're going to um, look into extending the day, that we need to look at starting the day at the time that's most developmentally appropriate for all our students. Um, because we know the data is there that um, our middle school students and our high school students would be achieving at a greater level if they were starting school at an appropriate time. So I think um, it's great to look into extending the day, but I think you should also be considering when you start the day. And we know that won't cost us money. So if we know it'll, it'll increase achievement and it won't cost us any money, I, I think it's really important to look at that as well as extending the day. Do you want me to respond? I'm happy. If you want it tonight, or if an, another time you want to talk to us more about the just the well, extending I, the day. So this chapter is 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 hitting what is um, evidence based, effective strategies, and what high performing schools are currently doing. And and so, on a national scale, folks are looking at ways to extend the day. You know, uh, more time with content. You know, everything brought into a six-hour instructional day, and more things crammed into with that six-hour framework. It just can't hold. It can't sustain it any longer. And so, some districts are running a, a fifth block at a high school, let's say, or they're going to 4:30 or 5, and offering those students who who are in Tier One instruction in mathematics getting that extra help that they need just in time after school and, it, and it's a setup in a, in a way so when you look at how they allocate resource on that model they probably are dedicating you know one and a half two teachers to make that happen and you know it, it's it's um, everybody coming to work at 7 30 and leaving uh, at 4 4 35 if you could stagger staff in a revenue neutral way and have people work 10 to 5 to provide that ex, you know ie specialists who can provide that. The, the most effective intervention out there is one-to-one -one tutoring for any child. And mm -hmm. to provide that opportunity is, is what we need to be thinking about. Okay. If we just keep doing business within that six-hour framework, I don't think we're going to change our results much. That's my guess. It's a guess. Thank you. Rebecca. Um, along the same, similar uh, vein, could we also look at block scheduling at the high school and if perhaps that's we can change that to have a more effective learning because that no, would be completely cost I was struck by that article though that they referenced in the in the uh, most effective secondary school a 90 minute uh, mm -hmm. block schedule in the document you know the article we read yeah. this evening that struck me I, I was um, surprised yeah. I mean, but maybe we need to restructure so it's only uh, 90 minute blocks and not the skinny block and maybe trimesters instead of quarters or other ways of rearranging yeah. it. Well, I think, I think we need to, you know, I think the skinny block is a way to flexibly look at what the needs of students are in some instances and provide them, you know, content all year long in a core area. Um, but I think we have to be open to looking at, you know, other ways to hit those 20, 25 percent who aren't proficient. We have to find other ways. it to like a regular like six like 45 minutes have longer classes it's necessarily like setting up how the 90 minutes is necessarily used because I find in some classes the 90 minutes is necessary and I get a lot done and then in other 90 minute classes I'm like I'm not productive mm -hmm. <laughs> so I feel like if we it can be mm -hmm. uh, fixed if the 90 minutes is used effectively that's a great point I was just going to comment when Carol was asking about the, the school start time. I have an email from the superintendent of schools in Oyster River, interestingly enough. I've not responded to it yet. It just arrived yesterday. Uh, he's, he is looking into uh, school start time, and he had been given my name as somebody who had been involved in it, and he asked if he could call me and if he could exchange ideas. I thought I'd pick his brain about some other things as well, mm -hmm. since uh, this is a cohort that I think Absolutely. we need to uh, go after. So I think I'll get one of those folders from your office for him. So, yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's, I, I, the only other document that you have in your materials is uh, Mr. Ballard has updated kind of a very preliminary look at the budget. And, right. Um, and so, so these numbers sort of tell us that uh, if everything stayed exactly the same, it would cost $1.8 million. That's what these numbers are. Status quo. 
Right. So could I ask both the administration and the board, um, so what kind of advice and how do we want to move, do we give the administration in terms of uh, creating a budget for us, because the budget season is coming up. So what do we, you know, we want to think about, what do we want to actually ask them to do? We want to give them a target number? Do we want to just, you know, have, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of at a loss myself. Yes, Dexter. So, I mean, we know the environment, we know better than this year from a, from a budget process that it conceivably could be worse. So, um, Mitch, I think you suggested uh, we at least give them a, um, a steady state target if we were to deliver the same program and the same services um, for the next fiscal year, what would that cost? And that, that may be reflected in this very preliminary budget, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but then realistically, I think we need to give them um, a 0% increase target and, and ask them to identify um, how they might get there. And I guess I would I would ask when they look at that, that they look at um, um, creative things that might not, I mean, obviously one way to get there is you cut program. Um, and, and that may be, in, in fact, the, the need, but there may be other, other actions that would, would, would be recommended um, that don't cut program, still allow us to deliver um, the, the same level of products and services, and we identify those. And, I think we get that fairly early because some of those some of those non-program stuff may have a longer lead time. I and mean, one of the things we ran into in mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. year's budget process is that in March we were beginning to open those items up, and and it was a little bit in some ways too late to sit down and really understand mm -hmm. how best to approach them. So we may need to be much earlier and to give us a little bit longer runway um, to get at some of those. More, more difficult items. I, I just, I, I'm convinced we're not, we, we won't see this number on this preliminary budget, proposed budget. I don't think we get it. I think, I, I think we get a plan on zero increase. Ken. And, and uh, my two fellow board members that are on the efficiency, we're, we're going to meet uh, at least this one more time this coming Thursday. And I don't think I've been overly satisfied and we've had a lot of philosophical discussion but if we are going to end up uh, equal to or less than um, what we have had last year I, I think we we have to be and I, I'm, I'm gonna I can talk to the other two both um, both of them and, and say look there are a couple of things we need to start to ask to move if that's if that's in fact uh, on the efficiency committee to say, you know, if, if we're going to have this cut, we can't any longer support or we need to start to throw it yeah. back over to the city side, whether it be, uh, you know, the athletic fields, whether it be custodians, whether it be uh, maintenance, um, to do any, it, it, we can't keep walking into the same damn wall and, and think we're going to get around it. it it's not going to happen. The wall gets thicker every year instead of uh, easier. And, you know, again, we've had some great discussions on the Efficiency Committee, but I haven't seen, and I don't know uh, whether Rebecca and Carol would disagree, I, I haven't seen progress um, within that group. And, 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 and again, I think it's because nobody wants to sort of pull the trigger, but we ha there, there are friends, there are uh, colleagues within, within the political realm of, of the city, but, um, you know, if we're looking at something like this, we need to say these are the programs we need to put in your lap because otherwise education starts to have a hurt. And that's why we developed this committee. This committee was developed to say how do we shift that burden? And it is a burden. And whether we have it or the city has it, the number, uh, the cost of it really doesn't go away. But maybe they can do it more effectively, and that was the idea of that. And, and again, I think that's the discussion we need to really have on a Thursday morning, and I'm hoping I can be there because we can't do it. Interesting. Again, if they disagree, that's fine. I mean, maybe they saw something. I, I missed one meeting, and maybe they've seen better results than what I, I feel we've got going on that group. No, I would I would agree with what you said, Kent. Mm -hmm. So you so so you think that there are things that could actually save money? 
It, 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 it wouldn't affect the overall city budget within the first year, possibly. It could, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it definitely would shift ownership mm -hmm. to where it might be more properly housed. Okay. But in the long run, I believe it can save. We have three examples. Mm -hmm. We have athletics mm -hmm. and, and the city rec department. We have our legal department mm -hmm. and we have personnel. Those are things that were once housed all internally with the school system. We share those resources and we've reduced the overhead and the cost. We, we, we no longer have two personnel people. We have one person at City Hall that works with the unions and that's worked well. Same with the athletics. Uh, the legal uh, was, was kind of all disjointed and we now have one versus 18 that we used to have to pay for. Definitely on the legal, I believe we've, we've, we've saved. Uh, nobody, talk about good matrix, uh, have we seen what is that savings over a mm -hmm. 3, 5, 10, and 12 years? Because some of the legal has been, uh, well, actually uh, human resources has been over 16 years. It was prior to my coming on to the board. They moved it, I think, just about the time I came on to the board. And that was housed. So. You know, what is the next one? What's the most logical one that would, again, have some cost savings so that we don't have to look at this? Hmm. This number is not healthy. Tom? Yeah, it's also uh, that time of the year where I think you know, one of the, the challenges that we're going to have uh, uh, if we start it off in the budget season is really taking a look at some of the bigger nuts. Uh, and I think uh, starting a conversation uh, with the teachers uh, that could have enough time to uh, create a, a dialogue that we could talk about uh, health care. Uh, I mean, that's a, a huge number this year, and, and there might be some creative solutions that could be done uh, if there's enough time to talk through it uh, with the teachers. Um, the same thing goes for, I mean, the, the salaries are a big number, and there's a, a contract in place. Um, but I think, you know, the, the the biggest thing that's uh, against us is not having enough time uh, to actually have the right discussion. And, uh, you know, specifically around health care and dental, um, those types of benefits, uh, I think there's some creative solutions out there that could deliver the same benefit to the teacher, knowing full well that there are people who have different requirements. And, uh, you know, being able to be flexible enough to offer people the right plan uh, that gives us the flexibility to to save money as well as have the teacher save money. Um, I think it's a it's an opportune time to, uh, and I would ask the administration to consider starting a conversation. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I guess I should ask Steve, this number that you have for the health insurance is uh, 9.5. Five six. Is that the number that's coming from City Hall? That's just an overall, or is that the actual amount that it's going up? What do we know? Let me take two minutes to explain what you got in front of him. Maybe that will help some okay. of the questions, if I may. What I did was just try to um, update the very, very preliminary big chunk. I get it right this time. Ed, budget that Ed had put together. Um, with some of the things that I knew and then point out some of the things that we don't know. So in terms of salaries, what we did was we took existing and we just did um, step in COLA without changing the COLA because I don't know what the COLA will be because we don't get that number until December 10th. But it's the rolling. It's the rolling COLA, right. So I, so I don't know what the rolling COLA is going to be because it's going to change when the numbers come out of December 10th. So I left it essentially the same. That would move up such things as retirement and FICA, FICA's in your other benefits. However, for the retirement, we know that's going up anyways. That's, I mean, we're already sure of that because we've got printouts from the retirement system. And if I can get to the meeting on Thursday morning, I'll hear exactly if they've had any changes, you know, in Concord. But what's posted on their website is that the rates, not the amounts, but the rates, that employers, school district was going to pay for teachers will go up 13%. The rate that the school district pays for all other staff will go up 
21%. So I've taken those rates and applied them to the adjusted stagnant COLA number, okay? So we know that this won't be the number, but it's all I had to work with. To answer your question about health insurance, if I take the announced rate and and I asked um, human resources in the city, what's the 10-year average? Because that's generally what we get adjusted to. The 10-year average is 9.56. So I adjusted last year's numbers by 9.56 as a guideline. Um, dental insurance, we've already been told, is 4.5%. I adjusted this year's number by 4.5%. That also could be affected by usage, by the way. But in other words, but that's just straight. Leave it termination, I left straight workers comp I have I do not have a number so I just took last year's increase and used it for next year or this year's increase and used it for next year excuse me life and disability I level funded for the simple reason that we've changed our disability insurance carrier and we have some savings and the life insurance is going to go down a little bit on the rate so even though the salaries in theory would go up I believe there's enough in there that I can leave it level at least at this viewpoint at this point in time um, unemployment I bumped up because it has been going up so I tried to adjust by actual the other numbers I just took using Ed's methodology of object code as opposed to cost center chunking and just tried to adjust them as best we could but there's there's no they're pretty much level this year with the exception of transportation and I just threw a number in there because we have to go out because our contract ends okay so other than that that's all that's all I've done okay, so I was asking that because we had an original number for the insurance that was but, higher that's higher last, than last that. year correct and then we were adjusted down and we got another little chunk of money back right so they took the so if they go the 10-year average so, that's okay. probably what it'll be okay. if they decide that the um, stabilization fund is in better shape and and the, and um, the, the manager decides to make an adjustment then they'll, we'll, they'll make the adjustment but and, and none of these are guaranteed numbers either just information as best I could have because what I wanted to do was show you the big chunks as that had already presented but try to adjust them by what we sort of know and what we do know and so if you look at that total well, obviously it's not a very attractive total and we know it won't exactly be that, but it's to get the conversation started. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. To follow up a little bit from what Tom and now to tie it in with, with Steve with the 10 year average, you know, we, 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 we go into good faith and we do five year contracts, which, you know, has been a benefit for us doing budget planning because uh, we have an idea other than these numbers that keep seeming to sprout legs. So I, I don't know if it's possible, and I, I direct it towards Steve Bartlett, is if there is a way to uh, prorate savings of a, of a five-year contract versus, and again, we have had a five-year contract for three terms in a row, so that gives us kind of a 15-year outlook on it. I think that we would see some type of cost savings to that, and maybe not. Maybe there's a disadvantage to it, uh, because I know, you know uh, others have said, well, you might be able to negotiate lower, and that may have some fact to it. But on the other hand, budgetarily wise, you know what that set amount is, because especially now that we do the uh, five-year average rolling caller, is it? Ten-year. Ten I'm sorry, ten-year average rolling caller. You have that set amount that you you you. you that's kind of a fixed amount, correct? No? No, every, I mean, that's the, by, the, by definition, the 10 year rolling coley, it takes you, 10 you, years you, in chunks. Right. And one drops off and one gets added on. So, yeah. I mean, unless your crystal ball is better than mine. Well, no, no, but you're, but you're only missing, if you have the 10 years, what I'm saying is. Well, you know, I, I, I will grant you that probably the swing okay. is probably yeah. much. That's what I'm getting at. Which, that's, is, which is why I did what I did, because. Right. The swing is going to be lower, so I'm. But again, where we initiated five-year contracts, the first in the city, has that been an advantage? I mean, there may not be. My feeling is there are some advantages. There are more advantages, and there may be disadvantages. And if that's wrong, then 
we need to sort of have that discussion. Is that is that the pathway we want to follow in the future? Because does it does it hurt us budgetarily? So uh, so I understand what you're asking is if you looked at the ten year rolling coal over the last fifteen years, mm -hmm. what that target is versus what the actual annual CPI might have been. But then if we had year to year type contracts, we, we might not be as well off. I get I get you. Uh, by every two years. But that so. mandate comes from City Hall. Correct. But that's not something that's no. no. Yeah, John Bohan. John Bohan mandates that five year contract because First time we had three years. Oh, that's absolutely true. And the extension no, he didn't. He out. doesn't mandate mm -hmm. the five-year contract. He, well, he, yes, he does. He, that's what the negotiations were told. Tom Flagler came and said, "It's a five-year preferred. Year. It was the preferred. It was, preferred. It was, it was strongly preferred. preferred. Yes. Oh no, I don't. Yeah, it wasn't it was, like choice. It no, wasn't like you can choose A or B. No, that's not true. The school board. We've had this conversation. The school board had the ability to decide if we wanted to do a three-year contract. Why do you laugh? My perception is not that. So that's, well, a, that's okay, because you perceive what you perceive, and I perceive what I perceive. Well, I that's was okay. in the meetings. We had our conversations. Well, I know, but I was I was in charge of that meeting, too, so I didn't perceive I'm just telling you that the city manager does not mandate that we have a five-year contract. That's not my understanding, but we can agree to disagree. But that's where we are. We're at, now We're we have a 15-year database. Right. We should be able to say, is this the pathway we wish to continue? Right, and this is the only one you have a rolling collar on, though. The others have been that, that's true. at the Boston that But index. we can look at 15 you can, years. You can look at that. You can. Still a lot of surmising. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of surmising. Okay. Well, Got enough information? Well, so so what I what I understood it to be is you know, get the get the real numbers on on the budget as it as it is at level fund and show us at zero. Yes, that's what I heard. Um, okay, so we have one more item on the agenda, uh, and I think I'll turn it over to Dexter since he's so good. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief on updating the committee on uh, the joint building committee. Uh, we're in the design development stage. Um, last meeting, we received the initial estimates um, based on um, design development. Um, uh, tomorrow evening, the committee's meeting again um, to go through a, a value management process. In the interim, uh, a subgroup of committee members and city staff um, have gone through and identified a list of, of potential what, what in the biz building business is referred to as a value management process. Effectively, it identifies potential cost savings um, or cost avoidance. Um, the estimates are, are higher now than our, our budget for the middle school. Um, not not unusual as you go through this phase of the process. Um, I think tomorrow night uh, we hope we'll come out of that meeting with identified items that will um, potentially reduce costs on the project. Um, I th we, we believe strongly we can do that without affecting any of the program um, that's going to be delivered by the middle school. Um, and as you all know, the reality is that until you actually get out to bid, um, you don't know what your costs really are. And um, we're still on track for having the construction documents completed and the bids um, going out in um, January of next year. And when those bids come back, and as contractors and providers begin to respond to those bids, um, then there'll be a, a, a final negotiation process with you, if you will, um, to get to um, the ultimate cost for the project. Um, we had a, a pre-meeting today with Gilbane and uh, our architects, JCJ, and I think um, what I'd characterize is that there's confidence that, in fact, this process will get us to um, um, the, the, the proper cost um, in budget and delivering the program that we've committed to. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the major headline, unless there's other things to, to report out. I mean, the Grand Street field still goes on, the building's down. Uh, but one other thing I guess I will publicly comment on is we did have a meeting um, with um, um, various people in the community, uh, people representing uh, people that uh, are, are from the Wentworth School area, who went to Wentworth School, um, and historians in the, um, in the uh, city. And the intent of that meeting was to understand um, what potentially mitigation efforts we should take 
um, to make sure that we capture um, the history of both the Wentworth School as well as the, um, the, the portions of the middle school that will be um, eliminated through the renovation process. And that's under the direction of the New Hampshire um, Department of um, Historic Resources, right? Um, so we're working in constant in the NDPA, which bizarrely has the final sign-off on this. Um, uh, and, and then uh, we had a crowd of, of probably f 15 people. Um, a, a lot of people that actually went to that school and have a lot of memorabilia that they're going to turn over to us. And so there's some interesting ideas. Um, I would say that the ideas uh, have a, had a broad range. Um, and, and I think that um, what we're, we'll be tasked with is to figure out how to boil those down and to deliver something within the, within the school program um, that, that makes sense and, and is cost effective. But we got some good input. So that was an important thing that, that we, I wanted to share with you. Did they find a contract? No. It was never, they never found it, so it was never, it was, uh, I mean, we think it was never buried, yeah. right? I've, I mean, they, they, they were pretty diligent. Yeah. The, the concept to look for it was based on something that said, I think we did one. But I'm not sure. Yeah. So, yeah. right, so we didn't want to take the chance. So trust me, that, because because we're doing, we did all the recycling of all the materials and stuff, it was. We, we, well we, sift, we sifted it out. Yeah. Yeah. They looked for it and it was well sifted. Uh, Dexter, uh, has the discussion as, you know, one of the first phases will be the Wentworth Fields will be done uh, next year. Right. Ownership and, and cost, as we talk about budgets all the time, that will fall on the city side. Is that is that clarified at this point? Even yeah. though they will be used for, it will have preferential for high school and middle school yes. the, the uh, direct softball. The rec department owns the operation of that field okay. uh, once it's completed. And you're right, we'll have preference, um, but it'll be used for, for other things and the rec department will be responsible for managing it and operating it. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering what happened to Safe Routes to School? We walked to school day and all that. Oh, uh, yes. I need, the mayor needs to appoint people. Um, and I asked him to. The committee, mm -hmm. um, the our rep from traffic and safety moved out of town and resigned from traffic and safety, therefore, resigned from the committee. And so, that is a mayor appointed position, and there are a couple others. And then, we don't have our city staff person anymore, and that is something that city manager has to choose to give us that resource back or not. And if, if not, then the committee is going to be very, very different because um, I don't know how to write a grant. I don't know how to apply to the EPA for things. So it's we just haven't been able to connect to get the committee back up. Is the money all spent? No. No, there's still projects that are being. So it's just, because um, that was that 90000 Yeah, no, the things that were, that we got the grant money for are being implemented, you know, as fast as public works can do it. Okay. Motion to adjourn? So All moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Second the motion. Let's do that.